Amazing. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining. It is a pleasure. Um, and I would love to start off by you telling me a little more about yourself and maybe about your career in economics and just kind of that kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah. I'm a, a Steve Conroy. I'm a professor of economics at the University of San Diego. I came here in 2004 from um, the University of West Florida, where I was um, a professor for five years and then came here to San Diego. I've been here ever since. Uh, I did my PhD at University of Southern California. I did my undergrad at Creighton University. Um, and I did my major, master's, and PhD all in economics. And um, let's see here. So I was from 2012 through 2015, I was the head of the Center for Peace and Commerce, the faculty director. And then from 2015 through 2021, I was the associate dean for undergraduate business programs. Wow, that is amazing. Um, If you wouldn't mind, can you tell me a little more about your experience studying economics at um, Craigerton, correct, and USC. Was that a positive experience? Was there one you liked over the other, even though they're so different? But uh, Yeah, Creighton University is in Omaha. Um, I, I enjoyed taking uh, the course. I, the first course I took in economics was just like a, a required one of my GE general education courses. And um, I loved it. I loved the professor. I loved the material. I loved everything about it. And so I took the next course, which was Principles of Macroeconomics, from the same professor <laughs> and uh, enjoyed that just as much as the first course. And then I was thinking about pre-med at that time, and I think my declared major was math. And so I think in my sophomore year, I changed over to econ and and never look back. I mean, I've always enjoyed economics and the way that economists think is kind of the way that I think it fits with um, kind of, you know, the way that I see the world. And economics was the type of course that once you take it, you never see the world quite the same way. Like you think about a concept like uh, opportunity cost. And I always tell students, you know, like you can think about opportunity costs in terms of you know, how much you give up, right? So like right now, I'm on this call, call with you. Um, what is the value of my best foregone alternative? So what else could I be doing and how much is that worth to me? Um, that's what opportunity cost is. So like if that next best thing would be, um, you know, um, going swimming or whatever, right? Then that would be the value of going swimming is my opportunity cost. But you can use a concept like that to explain a lot of things, right? So you can think about like, which line should you stand in at the grocery store? Well, <clears throat> people will say, well, the shortest one, right? But then you ask, well, why? You know, what's what's the big deal? Why not just wait in a medium line or a long line? And the answer has to do with opportunity costs. So it turns out that people would rather spend less time in line because that allows them to get out and do something else that they may actually prefer doing. So you can you can use that concept to explain a lot of things, not just, you know, people think of economics as just dollars and cents and business. And and certainly economics has a lot to say about that. But it also has a lot to say about just kind of everyday behavior, which is why it's considered a social science, because it's a, a way of kind of helping to explain the way people behave. Wow. I love that example. Yeah. Our time is so mm -hmm. valuable. And I think that also relates you know, economics isn't just money. There's a lot more to it. Yeah. Um, something I jotted down is I noticed that you were awarded top 50 undergrad business professors. Is that correct? Yeah. Through the poets and quants top 50 uh, business faculty in the U.S. Um, yeah, that was a nice honor. Um, it came in part because the USD School of Business at the time, now we're the Canal School of Business, but uh, we weren't named at that time, but um, we've always been part of the University of San Diego, of course. But it came because that was ranked in the top 50, so that made our faculty eligible for this award. And um, I got nominated for it and then uh, was selected for it. So it's a nice award. And you know, I'd like to think that it it's based on the combination of both kind of research and teaching. 
and service, including administration. So um, if you look at my, you know, if you Google Scholar me, you'll see that I've done, um, <clears throat> you know, a number of uh, research publications in the area of economics and business ethics and um, kind of, you know, applied microeconomics in particular. But, um, and then, you know, based on the the teaching that I do, I'm really passionate about teaching. It's um, one of the reasons why I came to USD, because I knew that faculty here were going to be and are rewarded for good teaching. And, and, and research matters too, right? It doesn't matter where you are as a professor, right? So what distinguishes professors from teachers is that professors also do research. So um, we're trained, the PhD programs train you to be researchers. And then, you know, a lot of times you just pick up teaching on the side, you know, which yeah. is kind of silly if you think about it, because the first thing we do generally is go out and teach people and, and there may not be a lot of training there. But when I was at the University of Southern California, we had teaching assistants uh, who were graduate students and I participated in those programs. And they really helped me, you know, it helped me to kind of learn how to teach. And then I participated in some continuing education programs and things on how to teach teacher training workshops and, and those kinds of things. But uh, I, at a, as a matter of fact, I think that basically teaching is somewhat, it's like leadership. It's somewhat of a learned skill, but there's also kind of an innate component to it, like Frankly, some people are just, you know, just really good natural leaders. And maybe it's the way they were, you know, maybe it's genetic or the way they were raised, you know, the environment they grew up in. Uh, but, you know, then you can learn about leadership and you can, <clears throat> I think leaders can learn and you can learn how to be a leader. But there's certainly a genetic component or a, or a kind of just an innate component. And the same with teaching. I think some people who are naturally more outgoing and um, better speakers uh, who are more facile with the English language or whatever language they're speaking are probably going to be better professors. The other aspect that we know from research that matters a lot is organization. So faculty, and, and this is the same with, with teachers in high school too, that teachers who are organized, who are better organized and can translate that into their class experience, generally get much higher teaching evaluations because students would rather be you know, taught by somebody who's organized and predictable and, you know, you need to read these assignments and, <clears throat> I mean, read these chapters and then do these assignments and and the exam will be on March 31st or whatever, rather than somebody who kind of shows up, yeah, what are we going to do today, class? You know, like, I'm all about you, you know, well, students generally don't like, I mean, they may like that for five minutes, but that doesn't translate very well into high student evaluations of teaching. Exactly. And it's kind of hard to prepare yourself fully as a student when you're not really sure when maybe an exam will be or yeah. when everything needs to be in. So I think that's a great aspect of a strong professor and teacher. Mm -hmm. um, I know you touched on it briefly and you kind of said that you took a gen ed class re relating to economics. But was there anything maybe during high school or your childhood that kind of got you into that field or was it just kind of like that class? Can you touch more on that? No, that's a good question because I had lots of different gen ed classes I could take in the social sciences category, right? I could have taken sociology. I had had a good high school sociology class. I could have taken psychology, but my dad is a psychiatrist and I kind of didn't really want to do what he did. And I felt like, yeah, I already know psychology, which I probably didn't, but yeah. I thought I did. <laughs> you <know>? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And so econ was there, and I did have an interest in business, and some of that comes from just interactions I'd had with people over the years, you know, a job that I had in high school at a nursery, like, you know, trees and that kind of thing. At a nursery, the people I worked with there were into, into business, and um, that kind of got me into investing, so I, I invested, and I lost a ton of money, not a ton of money, I lost basically everything I invested Uh in high school and that was a probably it was probably a terrible experience in one sense because it really turned me off to investing and it really took me maybe 20 years not joking to recover from that um maybe 15 but uh i had such a bad experience uh the the first stock i 
I invested in was like eight dollars a share <clears throat> and i thought well i can't get much lower than that and it did and did something called a reverse split which is <laughs> yeah <laughs> right so that you you own say 25 shares well okay now you only own 10 but the price is going to go up and that's a way of keeping the price from going too close to zero and becoming a penny stock yeah i finally sold out of it and I didn't have uh, a real understanding of, of what stocks were and how they worked until grad school, frankly. And then uh, things started to change for me. But <clears throat> it's only been maybe in the last five years that I've really become interested, almost like a, I don't know about a hobby or an obsession, you know, but I'm really interested in investing in the stock market. And um, I just bought, I've just bought two books actually that, uh, I'm interested in uh, learning more about, um, but and they address certain aspects of the stock market. But I listen to podcasts, I watch CNBC, you know, I read uh, financial uh, journal articles whenever I can, and that's not really an area that I do research in, but it's an area that I'm interested in as just as like I say, kind of a hobby, and it relates certainly to economics. So they're they're related fields; they're not the same, but they're related fields. So it's pretty easy for me to just kind of, you know, gear up quickly. <clears throat> exactly. And I think that it's like a really important like aspect to be knowledgeable and not just what you're like studying or what your like career is just to like expand <clears throat> it and it relates. Yeah. Um, and one question I have is like as a high school student, what are some like maybe podcasts, books, TV shows mm -hmm. that relate to economics that you think would be really beneficial for someone to have knowledge of? Okay, that's a good question. Um, I think one of them is Planet Money, and maybe you can put these links in the in the YouTube uh, whatever platform. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah, um, Planet Money, I don't really listen to that one, frankly, because it's annoying to me to listen to because it does assume a much lower level of economics knowledge. But again, that might be perfect for somebody who hasn't, doesn't have a PhD in economics, yeah. say, mm -hmm. right? They're not going to be bored with the same things that I'm bored with. So I would say Planet Money is a good place to start. A really good uh, podcast that I've been listening to uh, also is Motley Fool Money. And that one is also free, and um, they generally talk about both the economy and about individual stocks, the stock market, the macro economy. Because you know, one of the things that you learn when you start investing, and and learning more about investing is that the stock market takes place in the context of the whole macro economy, right? So if the if we're moving into a recession, say, that's going to have a big impact on so on stocks generally. And then certain stocks in particular, cyclical stocks will be most affected by that, say, right? Or if we're having um, some kind of technological shift, like right now it's all about, you know, chat GPT, AI, you know, artificial intelligence and all that stuff. So that's now the thing that everyone is talking about. It's kind of the narrative um, to, uh, to paraphrase Nick Mangi, um, who's someone I'm really interested in reading his book. That, that's the one I just purchased. But um, so about the narrative. And um, so, again, those podcasts, those two, I think, are a great introduction. Then you can also go for things like the Halftime Report, which is on CNBC. Well, you can also just subscribe to their podcast, the Halftime Report. And every day they talk about the economy and they talk about stocks. And as I said, they're all taking place, you know, the, the stock market's taking place in the context of the macro economy. So those are are some good ones. Uh, Jim Cramer's Mad Money is good. Is it Mad Money? Uh, no. Yeah, I think it is Mad Money. Um, so Jim Cramer. Then another interesting podcast would be the uh, Freakonomics podcast. So I think it's Stephen Dubner who manages that podcast. And, um, you know, that came from their very interesting book, Freakonomics. And if you haven't read a book, if you haven't read that book, it is dated now. Because I, think, I think it came out around 2006 or seven. So it's a little old, but the concepts in there are really interesting. And you can kind of see Steve Levitt, who's the professor, an economics professor at University of Chicago. You can kind of see his approach to dealing with real world issues, like, for example, 
you know, would Chicago elementary school teachers cheat? You know, and then he does the data analysis and turns out they did <laughs> and they might. If the yeah. incentives are strong enough, right? If the incentives are high enough, they might. And um, and even though you think, well, uh, school teachers, no, they would never do that, but um, they did. And so, yeah. <laughs> it, what it's what it's getting to is how people respond to incentives, the role of incentives. Um, so you know, economists are always taught to question the incentives. So, for example, and this might be some you know the type of thing that you know, would come from Freakonomics and that podcast on the Freakonomics podcast. But for example, if my two kids, when they were little, they're older now, but when they were little, um, if my sons were playing and uh, I said, wow, who did this? Um, well, they're both probably nervous that they may get in trouble if they say they did it. So if they point to each other and say, he did it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Then we've still got a problem. But if, if one of them says, I did it, well, he doesn't have an incentive generally, right? There might be some peculiar circumstances. He wants to take the fall or whatever. But in general, he has an incentive to put the blame somewhere else. So the fact that he's actually copying to it makes me really believe him, right? I would, I would probably say, wow. And in fact, I would probably want to reward the honesty at that point and maybe punish what happened. But But the fact that he was honest about it creates this conflict, right, as a parent, because normally you'd want to say, oh, okay, well, we're going to take you out to the woodshed or whatever, you know, yeah. I'm joking there. But, you know, we're going to punish you. We're in time out or we're taking away your treats or we're taking away your favorite TV show or whatever. Uh, but the fact that the the child was honest and, and, I'm, and I'm pretty sure he would be honest in that case because it was not in his self-interest to say that. Right. So, again, economists are trained to look at incentives and um, there's so much evidence that people really respond to incentives that this affects everything. Right. So how you set up human resources uh, situations, uh, rewarding uh, workers behavior, for example. Right. Uh, and then also policies. How do you want to set up policies at the state, local and federal government so that people respond in a way that we want them to respond Right. So you can't design systems that create incentives for for people to do X when you really want them to do Y. So thinking about incentives is important. And economists who are involved are always going to be thinking about, OK, so how are we setting up the incentives? How will people respond to those incentives? Is that the outcome that we want? If not, we better adjust the incentive system so that people will naturally do the kind of things that we want to do. Exactly. Say, for example. Mm -hmm. Right now, um, people may not be aware, but um, as my students are aware, because their uh, macro students are reading Constantino Sleeping on a Volcano. It's an interesting book about um, the volcano, by the way, is the uh, building pressure that we have underground, kind of, right? Like this building catastrophe that's coming from two things, low fertility rates and uh, rising um, financial burden for the elderly. And so what's that creating is a physical or a budgetary you know, volcano that's about to explode because we're gonna have huge debt. The debt is getting larger, not smaller now because what he calls the demographic dividend is gone. So now we are facing this kind of demographic crisis that's turning into, will turn into a debt crisis Around 2030 or so, a lot of people think that's when we're going to face, have to face this one way or another. 2030, maybe the 2030s in general, are going to be a really challenging time, in part because uh, of this low fertility that we've been experiencing. <clears throat> so back to my point, if you design systems right now that make it more expensive to have kids, then you're actually uh, creating, exacerbating the problem, right? You're, you're making the problem worse. So as a policymaker, you'd want to try to design systems that are going to be pro-natality, pro-fertility at this stage of our, of our life cycle as a, as a country and as a world, because it's not just the U.S., but looking around the globe, fertility rates have been declining uh, dramatically over the past 20 years. And so now we're facing a situation where the millennial generation, you know, for example, is just not having that many kids. And so... Uh, you know, young couples are making the choice either to defer marriage 
to get married later or not to get married at all. Or, or and, and again, as part of that, uh, not necessarily one-to-one, of course, but as part of that decision to have kids. And so that is affecting the, the economic reality that we're facing. So you'd want to design systems that are pro-natality at this stage. Yes. Wow. That was amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that was super educational. Um, mm-hmm. The final question I have for you is, Obviously, as an economics professor, um, as someone considering the fields of economics, what are characteristics in maybe a student or a person that you think would be fitting for this career path? Great question. So um, I would say curiosity is probably the number one trait. Um, So being curious about things, you know, wondering why, wondering why systems are designed the way they're designed, wondering why you know, um, the economy works the way it works. Just being inquisitive about things. So, for example, I was when I was working in Los Angeles before I went to grad school, I was working in direct service to homeless people, particularly homeless youth. And I was really curious about how how the economy um, might impact homelessness. And so that curiosity drove me to Uh, to apply for grad school and then to do research. And my dissertation was on income choices and earnings of homeless people, which wasn't exactly what I was curious about. But frankly, the the data were available for me to address those particular issues within that kind of larger field. The first thing is just to be inquisitive and to be interested in um, finding, finding problems and finding solutions to problems. Then the other thing is um, frankly, to be good at math. Um, People who are, who are not good at math struggle um, with economics because the language of economics is math. And frankly, the language of all the social sciences is becoming more and more mathematical, more quantitative. Obviously, you know, the advent of computers and and a lot of the data, uh, access to data that we have, and then analytical software like Stata or SAS or Python um, that are able to crunch these numbers, even Excel, you know, crunch the numbers easily and find out <clears throat> find out answers to to problems but to be a good researcher you really have to understand what's going on when when you hit <laughs> enter on a computer and let let it uh let it go because you need to uh, understand exactly what's happening there and then also be aware of the the particular uh traps or um <clears throat> kinds of uh like spurious correlations or multicollinearity, and a lot of these things that, that enter into these uh, statistical packages and modeling, uh, because frankly, you know, pretty much anybody can set things up and just hit enter, but you re- really have to understand <clears throat> fundamentally how this is all set up. <clears throat> Sorry. So, <clears throat> so at this stage, uh, if you're in high school and you're thinking about like, you know, should I think about economics or am I interested in economics? I would just encourage you, you know, whether you're good at math or not, to just take as much math as you possibly can. And that means if you get into Calc 1, take Calc 1, you know, don't don't take college algebra. And if you do okay in Calc 1, take Calc 2 and Calc 3 and take as much math as you can, because those really are <clears throat> the courses that are going to help you uh, with the the economic, the kinds of economic modeling that we do. I often used to think, in grad school, like if somebody walked in off the street into this classroom and they looked at the boards and they they looked at the screens and whatever, and they looked around the classroom, they would just say, this must be a really high level math class that they're teaching, but it was economics. And, and again, it gives you an idea of how much um, math is a foundation for, for the field of economics. So, so being inquisitive, um, and then also being good, having good quantitative skills, being good at math and statistics. And so I encourage everyone, uh, especially if you're in high school, keep all the doors open, right? And the way you keep all the doors open, because you never know what what you may be interested in <clears throat> as a career eventually, right? I thought I was going to be a doctor, maybe a dentist, and here I am, right? But part of the reason why I'm able to be where I am is because I kept the quantitative doors open. I just kept taking more and more math. And that helped me uh, with 
um, grad school. Although to be quite honest, notwithstanding all of the math that I'd had, um, I still struggled with the math in grad school. <laughs> yeah. Know? And as I looked around my classroom at that time, the classroom at that time in the mid nineties, and I'm assuming it's pretty similar today in most PhD economics programs, had a very high percentage of students from China and India in particular, and then other countries um, who really emphasize math. So uh, I cannot uh, overemphasize the importance of taking math classes if you're thinking about an econ pre PhD. Yeah, <clears throat> amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure and I'm so glad I was able to chat with you. You're welcome. I was happy to do it. I enjoyed our conversation. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.